ஓம் சத்தியம் பரம் தீமை 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 What is your aim in life? There must be one big aim in life. Now I may have an aim of earning a lot of money or I may have a lot, an aim of becoming famous. I may have an aim of maybe climbing some mountain before everybody else climbs that. But uh, these are all what we call life aims. They are not going to transform anything from me. They are not going to transform lower matter into higher matter. Right? When I am reacting with somebody, it is lower matter. And there is a scientific way of transforming that lower matter into something higher. And in that transforming, I get transformed. So, is there an aim? Have you come here with that express aim? Right? So, I was very shocked to see so many people because everybody is not interested in these ideas. These are just ideas which I am putting. Whether you can implement those ideas in your life. So, it doesn't matter whether you are a newcomer or what is your aim? With, with what aim have you come here? You do the exercises at home, you remain healthy. But is your aim a little higher in life to search for the meaning of life? To know what is it that takes birth and why it takes birth? For what reason? Is there a purpose behind its taking birth? Is there a purpose of why we are here? A purpose in nature, can we have a purpose for ourselves? All these are deeper questions. So you have to decide why you have come. I don't know why, why everyone has come. But I suppose they have come with some higher aim in life. So the most important aim is, uh, thing is aim. What is my aim in life? Now for any aim in life, how much am I willing to sacrifice? Can you see? If I ask a simple question, how many of us are willing to sacrifice our suffering? It's very difficult. Huh? Say tomorrow your son is ill, right? And I say sacrifice your suffering. You won't be able to sacrifice it. Whatever philosophy I tell you, your son is not your son. It needs real courage to sacrifice one's suffering. So we don't have anything else to sacrifice. So when you have your aim, can you sacrifice something for that aim? And no aim can be achieved without sacrificing. Now when you sacrifice, what is the aim in sacrificing? You get it? Supposing I may live like a sadhu, you know. I may get up early in the morning, I may be doing so, but the, but the aim may not be the right aim. You understand what I am trying to say? So the aim may be, I want to achieve something in life. right? So that is not going to feed the real side of me. But if I do the same things just for the enjoyment of doing it, then it may feed the real side of me. So doing the same thing. Can you understand? So there, we have to be very clear on, on our aim and why we are sacrificing for that aim. 
and there must be joy in sacrifice. If I complain in sacrifice also there is no. Now people come and tell me that Are, I had a wedding but I dropped the wedding and I came here. It means no difference to me. But they don't know what they are saying. You, you get what I am saying? They, they have now got a wrong aim. If their aim was correct then the wedding would mean nothing. You get what I am trying to say? It has no meaning. So, you are a newcomer, it's good. It's good to be fresh. But first of all, decide what your aim is in life. How much you are willing to sacrifice for that aim. How much you value the aim. Do I value what I want in life? Do I value my freedom? You get what I am trying to say. So, all this is important. Right? So, it is good to be a newcomer. It is good that we met, our paths crossed. I do not believe in coincidences. There is no coincidence in life. Everything is bound by law. Everything follows law. Right? There is nothing outside of law. So, there must be some purpose for our meeting. See, in life things are scattered. Today I want to do this, tomorrow I want to do that, day after I want to do this. <clears throat> it's very difficult to come to a real teaching. There are a lot of pseudo teachings in town, in the market. And we need a kind of inner magnetism which brings us to a real teaching. And a real teaching can only be about life. It can't be about experiences and you get what I'm trying. It has to be about our normal life, living every day, my daily living. How the transformation happens in my daily living. Right? So <clears throat> There is something in us, some magnetism in us which brings us together. Now we have come together, but that magnetism is not going to make you work. Now you will have to start implementing the teaching in your own life. It is very easy for me to say one sentence. You can, Moses can have a commandment that thou shall not lie. How many can follow it? How many can implement it? No one. It is very easy to repeat. So, I am just putting ideas in front of you. Whether, if your aim is clear, if you really want to do it, then you will start implementing those ideas in your life. And as you implement those ideas, you will understand them for your own self. Not because I am telling you. To implement. So, what aim you have come with, I don't know. But definitely at present I can understand that I have called you, you have come. <laughs> well. Yes? Yeah. So, I think you know about the movement of attention as you said, it is only one way to start and another one. So, for them also like, uh, they do not show up, but actually they are seeking work to I am drinking tea, my attention can be on the tea and my attention can also be on I drinking tea. That cannot happen. There is no self-consciousness. There is no possibility of self-consciousness. You understand what I am trying to say? In animals and plants there is a collective consciousness. There is no self-consciousness. Right? If one lion comes into heat, all the lions come into heat. You, you get what I am trying to say? There is, it is not individuality. Even though there is an individual lion. Right? If the sun rises, all the sunflowers have to look at the sun. One sunflower cannot say today is Sunday. Huh? Right? So, Animals and plants come under a collective consciousness. 
they don't have an individual decision making factor in them they don't have self consciousness nothing like free will the free will in animals is very limited you see while humans have a choice and that comes of free will whether we make the right choice or not is a different matter so we have what is called self consciousness and self consciousness only comes with the attention going in going in so and that is our not only is it our choice but it's our responsibility also okay hmm for the attention going uh, outward is the thing to know hmm so are we we have not used our choice as a human being attention is going out the animals it is going out but if there is no self observation then we have not used our choice as a human being no we have not taken the step to ha huh, yeah as as we are not exercising that option hmm. of Uh, self observation mm. to that extent we are just part of that collective unconsciousness of us just like we were on planet no we have an individual choice we have an individual choice but we are not making the right use of that choice supposing i just say that before being born we were going to talk about essence today so essence is that which is before birth so before being born every soul right every essence it says my purpose for taking birth is only this and nothing else can you understand what i'm trying to say the only reason why i am taking birth is freedom but we forget we forget and when we forget we don't know the purpose of why we've taken birth right we forget in the day time also why do we forget why do we forget why do we forget our dreams and <laughs> subconscious Now, what is the triggering factor that in the morning i wake up and i forget my dreams what is it that triggers so some period of what is ahead uh, and what is you took all those books and you not read anything ha huh. <laughs> <laughs> huh. what happens at awakening what happens at awakening very good what You differentiate between the fictitious as well. What happens at the point you wake up? The minute you open your eyes, what happens? No, that is okay. But what is the first thing that happens? You open your eyes. There is an influx of light. There is an influx of light, and the minute light comes in, we forget. You get it? At the what we don't know is that the moment of death the moment of death is there is a very very powerful influx of light and in that influx of light we forget this whole birth everything <laughs> all the dream is gone you get it and what happens when we are born as a child we open our eyes to the world the first thing which goes in is light and we forget what happens in the mother's womb okay. so we must learn to be receptive to light without forgetting and this is practice forgetting hard work no then we'll remember it's not that we have forgotten we can't recall 
No? So the power of recalling and the influx of light, they have something over this. As if that light just washes away the whole past birth and it's gone. We have to practice it. Hmm. Yeah. You wake up and if you try, start practicing, then every day you'll remember. Every day you'll remember the power of recalling. A point will come, maybe you're conscious in your dream also. You'll wake up in the dream. You wake up in this dream. At present, I'm in the line of Accident. This much is clear to everyone that I am in the line of accident. The line of accident is just a line of recurrence. Everything that I did yesterday recurs today. And everything that I do today recurs tomorrow. Nothing changes in my life. The same events come to meet me. Am I clear on this point? When I say events, don't talk of people and uh, geographical situations. Right? You get it? Today I am irritated because of the coolie. Tomorrow I will be irritated because of my wife. But I am still irritated yesterday and I am still irritated today. It is just recurring. Nothing is changing in my life. My life is one big accident. That much you've understood. This is not clear. This is clear. Hmm? Right. Now I bring in consciousness. Right. So one irritation, I see it and I try to separate from it. Whatever the techniques of separation we'll go into later. Right? But I try to separate from it. I bring in consciousness on the situation. And in that bringing consciousness, now I am struggling with the line of accident. There is an inner struggle going on. I am trying to pull myself out of one line of time into another line of time. Am I coming across in this? Right? Now, if at that moment I am free of that irritation, that irritation transforms from some base metal into some higher metal. There is an alchemical transformation from some lower matter into some higher matter. So I am free from that irritation that is mukti, moksha, for that moment. Right? I am free of the law of accident. And that my making that effort to be free, I am sowing a seed for a new effect. Now I cannot be irritated tomorrow. Not so easily. You understand? So now tomorrow is not going to be a recurrence of today. It's going to be a reincarnation. Something new is going to happen. I don't know whether I am. <coughs> because that irritation cannot happen tomorrow. I am over with it. I have risen above it. Because I was in the line of accident, because of that irritation, that all the events in the line of accident were already destined. And I was following that line. Now I am following some other line. My death will also change and so many events in my life will change. People who are going to meet me tomorrow will be different people. Because I have now sown a new seed and that is going to invite a different kind of you see? And really if you practice, you will see overnight your friends will change and so many things will change. So from the line of accident, I move to the line of cause and effect. I have sown a new cause. I move back to the line of accident. Again I move. And between these two lines, I keep on struggling till I, my consciousness reaches a point where I am now in the line of cause and effect. And I suddenly see that all the events in my life have changed. I would have invited totally different events. Then I start observing, as I observe my inner states, 
and I go deeper. Okay. What do we have to observe? Let me just make a list out of for you. <laughs> right? It will be a little easier. Supposing I take attention in the first thing, what do I see? We said in the morning, what was the first thing? The state, the mood. Yeah. Hmm? You'll say, let's go for a good movie, but I'll say I'm not in the mood. A movie may be good, but what happens? My mood is bad. Right? So the inner state huh, is not complementary to the movie. Right? It's the inner state. And these moods keep on changing. These moods. I don't know how many of you are acquainted with the theosophical literature. Okay. Now theosophy talks of different bodies. And between the physical body and what they call the astral body, they say there is a curtain. There is a curtain and they call it the etheric body. Right? This curtain is a kind of Lakshman Rekha. Nature has put it there. It's like, what do you call, fog. Mist, dhumas. Hmm? No, no, dhumas. Dhumas. Ek pardoch. Nature does not want you to look inside. Nature is not interested in your progress. Hmm? Because nature's purpose for man is something totally different. Right? So she has put this curtain inside. Where when I look inside, I can't see anything. And I have to go through that curtain. Now, as I observe my moods, as I observe my inner states, I start seeing that those states are made by a certain matter. You get it? Just now I am in a depressive mood. Right? And why am I in a depressive mood? Because this etheric matter, this foggy substance has taken a certain shape. Now you understand what I am trying to say. So now I am recognizing that shape by observing my mood. Right? So as we go in, the first layer that we will be observing is our own moods. Right? Now as we are free of the moods and we are able to go further, Inside, there will be another layer and that will be the layer of contradictions. <coughs> we don't see these contradictions. If we were to see these contradictions now, this very moment we would go mad. We don't see them. Can we observe them, these contradictions? Can you just try to understand what I'm trying to say? Now there are some contradictions which are very easy to observe. Uh, I don't know what the English saying is, but in Gujarati we say man manavani vat sukhye. What do you call it in English? Anyone knows? Huh? The two bogies of the train are this thing, I can't bear the shock. So the railway has put buffers in between so that the buffers absorb the shock. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? Supposing I say I've lost a lot of money in business. So I'll say, ke bhai, ave, any what, how, can, can you understand what I'm trying to say? Huh? It was huh, in my destiny. Now this is nonsense. Huh? Absolute nonsense. But you see how we've created the buffer. Now we absorb the shock. Right? 
and our life is full of these contradictions which we can't see at all. We can't see at all. Another contradiction, the fruit on the other side is always sweeter. Right? Before marriage, the fruit on this side was sweeter. After marriage, the fruit on this side is sweeter. Can you see what I'm trying to say? It's like as if we have different walls inside of us. Right? I'll tell the same girl huh, that before marriage you were so sweet, now you have changed completely. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. But the, I'm on, that time I was on this side of the wall, now I am on this side of the wall. I will contradict myself all the time. Uh, I will give uh, somebody a big lecture on character. What is a good character and what is a bad character. I am driving on the road and there is one scene of some actress over there and I start feeling sex energy rising. But yesterday I gave a big lecture on character. Can you see the contradictions? Or I am watching the TV and suddenly I am excited by some scene. Or I have yesterday just given a lecture on chastity. So, there is a whole layer inside of the mind, our whole psyche, where there is contradiction upon contradiction upon contradiction. And we have to take the attention from the, we start observing our states, we start observing the contradictions. It's a very long process. It's a very long process. And you see, the, when you observe other people, it's very easy to see these contradictions. You see, somebody will sing, sit in the temple and they'll sing a bhajan, Oh, I am Dasi, Meera and you are God and my love for you are is eternal. And they'll come out and they'll spank the child. Can you see the contradiction? Right? And they don't realize it. They're living under that hypnosis that their love and Meera's love is the same love. And everywhere in our life is, everything is contradictory. And there are so many contradictions which we are holding on over there. Right? And as we move from the layer of uh, states, moods, we will start observing these contradictions and they are very painful to observe. Very, very painful. Because it is at that moment that we will realize that we are everything that we see in other people. It's very difficult, very difficult. Jesus says, the moat, the anger, the moat, the anger that you see in thy brother's eye is thy own. <coughs> right? Now, Try to go into these contradictions because every day we are looking at TV, we are looking at the news, we are looking at so many things. Supposing I divide life into uh, just for, you know, just for understanding just now, I divide it into a positive side and a negative side. And we will put, uh, say, violence in the negative side. Violence about anything. It's a real incident. She called me one day in the morning and she's telling me that I'm, the, this was I think two years ago or one year ago, that girl was raped, when was it? It was all over the news. It's two years back? Two years back. She called me one morning. I'm going to take part in one, what do you call? Morsha. Uh, now, just try to see the contradiction over here. Now, if I'm fighting in a Morsha, Am I throwing out aggressiveness or am I throwing out peace? Which side of life is increasing? The violent side or is the peaceful side? Which is increasing? 
I am throwing out negative emotion into the violent side of life by expressing an opinion against whatever happened. I think I am doing something very good. Now all that violence which I am throwing out and which millions of people are throwing out in that morcha which he was going to attend. Right? Is that when that violence becomes somebody else's thoughts, is that person going to rape somebody else? Just tell me. Can you see the contradiction every day in our life? We don't know what we are doing. We don't know what we are doing. This is what Patanjali calls avidya. Vid means light, avidya. There is no light in our life, absence of light. And what we feel is right is totally wrong. And this whole layer of inner contradictions. So as we go in, suddenly those contradictions will start coming out. We will start observing those contradictions. And it's a very, very painful period because everything that we thought of ourselves is totally wrong. Let's take another contradiction. Some years ago, in uh, New York, there was a blackout. Eight years, there, eight, sorry, eight hours, there was no electricity. And it was as if the animal nature in man was given free will. Hmm? Shops were looted. So much happened in those eight hours, which maybe in so many years would not have happened. Now, I see this beautiful object in a shop. Why don't I pick it up and put it in my pocket? Fear of getting caught, fear of society, fear of name. Now, supposing all those fears were not there, it is not through inner understanding. Please try to understand what I am trying to say. There is this whole inner contradiction which we are living. I am a very good man, uh, what do you call guy? I remember that what we, uh, little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating his Christmas pie, put in his thumb, pulled out a plum. What a good boy am I? Uh, this is all we do throughout our lives. What a good boy am I? And it's the biggest contradiction. And we don't observe it. When we are going in the store, I am attracted to something. Try to see the inner contradiction. This is an opportunity. So, there is a whole layer of inner contradictions. We hate that which we love the most. We don't know what is real love. Real love has no opposite. We cannot hate. It's not possible. Even if your worst enemy comes in front of you, it's like a lamp. The lamp does not decide, I don't want to throw light on this person. It has to throw the light. There, there can be no, what do you call, distinction. Right? So, the second layer is of contradictions. Our love and hate goes together. We have the raw material for love. But the transformation into love has to happen through consciousness. The raw material for love is affection, what we call in Gujarati as lagdi. You understand Gujarati? No. Lagdi. Affection. I don't know Hindi what you call it. Huh? Lagao, lagao. Right? That is the raw material for love. This lagni, this affection, it always feeds the eye. 
If you are good to me, then the affection will grow. Right? Now, if that affection, which is the raw material for love, if I have transformed it into love, into a higher substance, then the minute you criticize me, nothing changes. But if you criticize me now, my affection will turn from love to hate. Yeah. So, lagni, that affection is like the material in the stock market, it goes up and down. Yeah. But love does not change. It cannot change. And this is our whole effort is as we bring in consciousness, this lower matter becomes higher matter. Then there is no distinction. It just falls on whoever is in front of you. Okay. So second layer, contradictions. We will talk very deeply on this some other time. Habits. Habits. We are a bundle of habits. And as we go into the centers today and tomorrow, we will see there are habits in our thinking, there are habits in our feeling, there are habits in our moving, there are habits in our instinct. We are a bundle of habits. Our thinking is totally habitual. We don't think for ourselves, we are thought. I am going to make a distinction over here. Having a thought and thinking a thought, what is the difference? In Gujarati it is easier, vichar au and vichar karu, in English the difference does not come out so well. right? Huh? Having a thought and thinking a thought. What is the difference? One, one is with our consciousness, one is with our consciousness. Right. right. Like between having a thought and thinking a thought, there is an introduction of consciousness. Okay. How will we do it? How will we do it? Is this on? This, this thing is on. Can you switch it off? Yeah. How will we do it? How will we do it? Can you see the whole brain is filled with habitual associations? She insulted me, I have a thought. Because she came to meet me, I have a thought. The minute I be go into a negative state, I start thinking the thought. Can you see where you have to introduce consciousness? She took my money, I have a thought. But I am going to show her is, I think the thought. The brain is a machine to make thoughts, you can have thoughts. But can you separate from thinking the thought? And that can only happen if you are aware of your state. You don't allow a negative thought to create a negative state. Otherwise, you will start thinking the thought. Then you are a victim of it. You are gone completely. The bus is late. I have a thought. The government is useless. I think the thought. <laughs> this happens every day. It happens every day. See, I have to introduce consciousness over there. My wife is angry, I have a thought. Right? She has no right to do this to me, is I think the thought. Am I coming across in this? Okay, right? So in the Bible, they have a beautiful word, it's called metanoia.
and the normal meaning which is generally taken everywhere is to repent, to repent, prayashchit karu. Uh, the original gospels were written in Greek and the Greek meaning is totally different from the normally taken meaning. The uh, Greek meaning means to think differently, to think differently, to change your th thinking to change the way of thinking, make a new pathway in the brain, get out of the old habitual pattern. And that is why we do different exercises for this and one of them is the scale exercise. Right? So I have a problem with her, she insulted me. Now I start looking things in sc on scale, I start doing the scale exercise. So I say, oh no, but everywhere else she's a very nice person. In her job she is doing very well. She looks after her mother and father very well. Now, in all this, where is the position of my herd? So it's very insignificant. Can you understand what I'm trying? Try to look at people in scale. Try to look at people in scale. And suddenly you will see that that which I'm reacting to has no place. That is one exercise which we can do. The other exercise which I talked in the morning is find different meanings for the same thing. Keep on changing the meaning. So as different meanings come out of the same thing, suddenly that hurt has no consequence. Pratikarman, what we call. So <coughs> habits in thinking, habits in feeling, right? And we copy everything. I remember the uh, first time I was going to South Africa, I asked my daughter that what do I bring for you from there? She said, bring me some tight skirts. So I said that better elaborate because what you mean by tight and what I understand by tight, right? Could be a different. So it's, you don't know anything. The ones that Priyanka Chopra wears. So now I said I've not seen a movie of Priyanka Chopra, so huh, I wouldn't know. So it's, you don't know anything, right? Can you see these young girls? Everything is imitation. There is nothing original. Nothing original. One day she'll come and say, "I've fallen in love with this guy. Why he looks like Shah Rukh Khan?" Everything is a habit. What is original in our life? Do we have one original thought? One original thought. So these habits, they go into our mind, into our thinking, into our feeling, into our moving. A young child learns by imitation. The moving center. We are going to talk about the moving center. An instinct. instinctive habits. We are a bundle of habits and it takes long time to observe those habits in our thinking, especially in emotions because emotions are too fast, too fast. We have no platform on which we can observe our emotions. They are moving much faster than our speed of observation. And that is why when we start the process of self-observation, we start with the moving center our movements and we later go into emotions. Anyway, habits. Attitudes. Is even deeper than habits. Much deeper than habits. And they come on so automatically, so automatically. We just don't realize that they've come on. They just switch on. It's as if we don't have to live life for ourselves. We have this bundle of attitudes. They're like computer switches. Anything comes in and the switch on and we take an attitude. I see somebody of another religion, attitude. 
somebody wearing a different kind of clothes attitude somebody eating a different kind of food attitude and just comes on automatically and all the attitudes are formed when we are very very young in our childhood it's very difficult it's very very difficult just imagine that i'll say oh i'm a very broad minded person and <clears throat> you know i accept life but supposing my daughter comes and tells me oh i'm marrying this person of this religion what will be my first reaction will be an attitude automatic later on my ah uh, culture and everything will come in right ah i understood broad mindedness but immediately i'll take on an attitude and it's these attitudes cannot be observed in ourselves we have to ob observe them first in others and then in ourselves there is a way of observing in ourselves and that is through gestures what we call as mudra not the mudra gran gyan which is floating around everywhere uh, do this and gas problem goes away <laughs> not that nonsense have a definite purpose can you see these are layers when you want to observe your own attitudes you start using mudra that each movement of my hand is coming from an inner attitude to work on our gestures and finally the last thing which is inside is the chief weakness then comes the soul we have to go through all this chief weakness in life somehow the it i had the good fortune to have many teachers before i met tawaria sai and with one of them i spent 7 years and he was swami ramdula re bapu <clears throat> and he was a complete master and the final thing which the guru does before leaving the disciple then the disciple is walking on his own journey and the last thing the guru when he knows that this body is not going to last because nothing the body cannot last is he wants to break the chief weakness he wants to break the chief weakness and it's very painful very very painful and i remember that day we were sitting uh, there were about 50 60 people and they had all come to him and they all have a very here this uh, guru has come this maharaj has come a very very high opinion they've come with so much of you know inner bhav inner this thing to meet him and she is taking care of him she is there and in front of all these people he shouts that you are a prostitute you are this you are that you have done this you have done that and started linking her to names and this and that now you can see that if he was bothered about what other people think about him right then he would be bothered about the 50 60 people sitting over there that what will they think i'm speaking such words i'm speaking such things but he's not interested in them because they are not going to change anyway he is interested in that one disciple of his if he can break her chief weakness before he leaves the body he has done his job his work has been done and for a woman especially an indian woman the one of the deepest ingrained this thing is her you know character and when the guru 
throws a stone which is totally false has no relevance whatsoever and he went on for nearly two hours and the beauty is that after two hours she comes to him would you like a cup of tea see and this is the final act the breaking of the chief weakness we don't even know what our chief weakness is and the soul is behind that chief weakness that what we are looking for that what we are searching for so these are some ways of explaining i've just told you that uh, as we observe inside layer by layer this is what we will have to see the final thing will be of course everyone has their own chief weakness and we will talk later on about self love what is self love and the observation of self love because that will lead to lead to the observation of the chief weakness <clears throat> okay any questions anyone has on this i can put this in another way also it doesn't have to be in this language bol any other question on this hmm is this related in some way to the layers about can we sort of get a sense of where we're getting at from the top it just comes and attacks us supposing i'm driving my scooter right and one guy just crosses the road hmm and maybe that guy who crossed the road was a policeman and the monkey you know the monkey starts and uh, nothing has happened my scooter has gone this way yes cross the road everything is in harmony but the monkey starts and the monkey says supposing he had touched my scooter right so what if he is a policeman i'll show him who i am can you get what i'm trying to say can you see the self love i am something the self love can you see that you can you see it how the chief weakness attacks us now there was no need for it to come but it created its own situation and came we come to know like certain situation we need a certain emotion maybe good or bad maybe like i am jealous of something i see a good bike and i get jealous of a guy hmm. so later on i come to know like i had a feeling of jealousy when i saw that bike hmm. the next time we try to not to be jealous of such situation but somehow somewhere like the mind does the trick and it makes you bring to that point again hmm and okay i mean later on we can go like okay that again has happened what we are not supposed to do and after that it may start like getting start and it starts self criticism or more guilt feeling of guilt so like how to get over to that so what have you not done supposing i want to play in a cricket match what do i have to do practice what have you not done your homework what is the homework what homework have you not done say today i got jealous right i saw somebody's motorcycle and i got jealous okay now where do i have to do my homework what has happened tell me it is a moment of my life which i realize has gone in darkness darkness right and that jealousy just overtook me at that moment now where do i do my homework tell me 
Okay, when I go to sleep at night, can I go through the day? Can I go through the day for five minutes? Are, I saw that scooter and I felt jealous. And I can, there was no consciousness at that time, but can I bring in consciousness at that time? That which happened in a situation of non-consciousness, can I bring in consciousness now? Well, it's the past. Well, it's the past. It is not the past. The past is now. Because the jealousy is not past, the jealousy is now. So I have to do my homework. Are, in the morning I got hypnotized by jealousy. But the next time I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And I'm looking at that situation. I'm not judging the situation. Don't judge it. Jealousy is not bad. Jealousy is jealousy. Everybody suffers from it. But there is a way to be free of it. Huh? So I just look at it and I leave it over there. Again, after a few days, I'm jealous again. Again, I at night, I look at it, be free of it. Again, after a few days, I'm jealous again. Again, at night, I look at it, put consciousness. After three months, as I'm going to be jealous, suddenly consciousness will come. And at the moment of getting jealous, I'll be conscious. Oh, now I don't want to do this. But without homework, it's not possible. Just by my telling you, it's not going to work. Right? You have to... <coughs> You understood this? Right? So you have to create a special memory. And don't mix it with our normal memory. Memory. Our normal memory is terrible. It's the most corrupted thing we have. Right? So don't mix it with that. Keep that memory separate. Don't share it with anyone. Because the minute you share anything, you corrupt it. Of course, they have all these organizations where you share. But all we do in sharing is corrupting. Right? Yesterday I went on a picnic, but when I share the picnic with her, I always put myself in a better light than you. So the original memory is gone forever. It's not gone forever, but nearly forever. Can you understand? All our memory is corrupted memory. Because the minute we repeat it to somebody else, we never repeat it with the same emotion with which it happened. It's not possible. Unless we are free of self-love. But when I repeat it to her, I will say, I did this, but they did that. And I already knew that this was going to happen. The puncture was going to happen. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? So, keep it as a separate memory. And every night before going to sleep, practice. Okay, this happened, this happened, all in unconsciousness. Put consciousness over there and keep on practicing. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it's, it's not a real self-love. This is a false identity of the self. What is real self? When the self dissolves, love remains. Self dissolves. Love remains. That is real. Yeah, we'll come to it. We'll come to it. It's totally false. Totally false. There's nothing like swarman. No? No, we don't know what the swar is, what swarman. It's nonsense. Huh. Yeah. The memory. Memory gets corrupted. We put bad sectors into the memory. Yeah, it is a good therapy. We are not talking about therapy here. No, that is a good therapy. But therapy is not going to free you from the pattern of doing it again. Therapy will get rid of a little bit of luggage. Freedom can only come from inner understanding. Right? And in that inner understanding, there is no therapy. You, you get what I'm trying to say? The minute I share anything with you, it's no more, no longer original. It can never be. Because everything has to go through this self, I. And I am always better than everyone else. 
you understand what I am trying to say. It gets colored and colored and colored. The famous story which I always tell is this. Socrates was dying. Right? One of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful deaths. And his wife Xanthope was crying. And Socrates looks at her and she hated Socrates. She didn't give him one second of peace, not one minute, but not one second of peace. And she threw boiling water on his face that it all became pocked. And she's crying and Socrates is saying that, why are you crying? You should be happy. Yes. He says that all these years there was not a single moment of peace or harmony between us. But after I die, you will tell everyone how my life with Socrates was so good. And how I can't live without Socrates. Can you see? And this happens with, I've seen so many examples. I don't want to take their names because some of their friends are sitting over here. It happens with people in our lives. They are staying together. They are fighting every second. And one person dies and she will say, oh, life was so beautiful with him. And without him, life is useless. We corrupt the memory completely. So, try, don't share these experiences which are a part of our sadhana. Because we'll corrupt them. Don't share them. And every night keep on building into that memory. And it is that memory which will bring freedom. See, at the moment of shooting the arrow, Karna forgot the mantras which his guru had taught him. It was in the wrong memory. Can you get what I'm trying to say? He forgot. And that was the end. Yeah. No, 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 no. Then you will corrupt it with, I am a teller of truth. <laughs> and these truth tellers have a much bigger, bigger egos than lie tellers. <laughs> Terrible egos they are. Uh, be afraid of truth tellers. Stay away from them. <laughs> Better to have lie tellers. They are normal people. Uh, so don't... We are not on the path of truth or lie. We are on the path of rising in consciousness or... <laughs> Falling in consciousness. For rising in consciousness, I may have to say a lie. Because that lie is dissolving my ego. And if I speak the truth and my ego increases, it's worse than a lie. So we are on a different path. So we are not on the path of morality. In morality, there is truth and Lies and all that. Here we are on the path of whether I have risen in consciousness or fallen in consciousness. Only from the corrupting the memory. Okay. Yeah, then if you... We don't want to say it. The minute we say it, we will corrupt it with truth. How better I am saying the truth. Now, in the morning, we said we are... The self is made of... How many parts? Three. Thank you. I was looking for some word. I didn't want to repeat that word false twice, but you helped me out. I am a father. Where is it? In these three, where is it? Quiet. In my personality. Right? She says, you are a useless father. I feel hurt. And I say, what a good father am I? That is in which part? False personality, in my imaginary part. You understood what I am trying to say? Okay, we are going to now go into this. Huh? Right? What are we feeding? Are we feeding the real or are we feeding the false? And our whole lives goes 
life goes in feeding the false, the whole life. When we are born, we have no personality. A child has no, he is only an essence. Only an essence. Essence is not of this earth. It comes from a much higher source. It seeks a body. It wants to take birth. And it wants to take birth because it wants to perfect itself. What does it have to do to seek a body? What does it have to do? What does it have to look for? Look for? Parents. parents. So what does it borrow from the parents? What does it borrow from the parents? Body. Samskara. Samskara. So it borrows DNA from the mother, it borrows DNA from the father. Can you just try to observe each part <coughs> of the <coughs> essence coming down. It comes from a higher source. It comes to the earth to express itself in a human form. It has to borrow DNA. There is nothing like mother and father. There is nothing like my son or your son. It is just one essence which has borrowed two sets of DNA. It allows us to experience the higher emotions of love and having a child is a different matter. That is there, that's the instrumental cause. Those emotions were lying deep in our subconscious mind. By the birth of the child, those emotions are allowed to express themselves. The child is not our child. It is an essence. This is very, very difficult to understand. And that essence, to express itself, it has to borrow DNA. <clears throat> now what, can you just tell me, what would happen? What kind of limiting factor would come over here? What kind of limiting factor? Because this is the basis of yoga. <clears throat> what kind of limiting? Uh, some of Krishnamurti's old dialogues and they have tried to touch on this but they have not touched on it very well but just let us try to think about it over here. What could be the limiting factor? Between that essence which comes, the DNA and the child. Now this essence comes through DNA. Now can we just try to go into that the essence may be like a huge ocean, right? But everything which is lying in that essence will not be able to be expressed because the DNA will only allow something to be expressed and something not because of the genes of the mother and father. Am I coming across? No, 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 no. <coughs> hmm? <coughs> DNA will be a limiting factor. If my father was a very angry person, my essence may not have so much of anger, but 
something else in the essence will not be expressed and anger will be expressed because it has to come through the DNA. Am I now coming across in this? So, when we are moving into yoga, when we are moving into self-observation, we are bypassing heredity. We want to go into that essence which was before the DNA. Because the very action of the DNA has uh, limited the expression of the essence. Like I said, I was uh, with Ramdula Rebapu and he had one of his beautiful sayings. Sab kuch niyojit hai, fir bhi uska ayojan karna padta hai. So, everything is lying in the essence. But you have to find a way for it to bypass the DNA. So, the essence is not made of earthly matter. It is not made of earthly matter. It is made of some other matter. That is why we study astrology to study the essence. It is a study of essence. Of course, now it has become a shameful system of prediction which is... (coughs) So, the essence, it relates to different parts of the DNA. It chooses something and then it keeps something discards something and then it expresses itself as a human being, a human form. It takes a human form. The only thing the parents do is bring the two sets of DNA together. They have no other function whatsoever. (coughs) Now, for one essence to manifest there is large scale death. Only the de- energy of death allows the essence to manifest. Can you tell me how? How? The biggest hinsa is here in that birth of the child. In that cannot birth, I'm wrong over here, conception of the child. Conception of the child. Tell me. Right. Right. Beautiful. There has to be energy of death on a very mass scale. For one essence to pass from some unknown dimension into a seen dimension. It is only the energy of death which allows that. So, millions and millions of sperm are released, but only one sperm reaches. All the other millions die. And it is this release of the energy of death which allows that essence which was unmanifest to be manifest as a physical body. I don't know. Can you understand what I am trying to tell you? Huh? Not here. See, millions of sperm are released. This much you get. And one sperm reaches. All the other millions die. So, can you see energy of death being created on a mass scale? It's a different energy. No. See, my question is that, you know, why the essence has to go through this route? Because when it is such a limited factor, mm-hmm. why do we require, you know, the essence, why do essence require a body? Uh, <coughs> so a lot of the essence wants to perfect itself. Without a body, it cannot perfect itself. So, the only route it can come is through this route. And for that root, millions of cells have to die. Then only one can be born. Right? Is the energy of birth the energy of death? If you ask an astrologer, what is the 
what is my time of death? He'll say the point of birth is point of death. What does he mean? I want you to understand these two points in our life, point of birth, point of death. And are they the same point? Is life a straight line or is it a circle? Do we come back to the same point? Yes. Do we come back to the same point? It's very difficult for us to understand. Very, very difficult. Why is it difficult? Because we'll never understand a sense unless we understand this. Why is it difficult? Why is it difficult? No. For, because of our conception of? Our conception of? Time. Our conception of? Time. Huh? What is, how do we see time and what is time in nature? Can we see time as energy? Not as hours and minutes as seconds. Time as energy. Can we see it? So, the point of birth, where in life do we experience that same energy again? The time of death. Only the time of death, unless we learn to consciously die. It's a different thing. Am I coming across that can you see time not as, try to keep this hours and minutes and seconds on the side and try to have a different because when we are talking about essence, everything is now in the essence. There is no past or future. The minute it takes on the body, the body is in temporal time. The body is in temp, the essence is in eternal time. There is no birth or death over there. I, ah, am I coming across? The body is born, the body dies. The essence is in a different time. It does not understand when you say this happened yesterday. The essence does not understand that. You have to change your inner understanding of time. Only then can we understand what the essence means. Because people talk about past life and this life and they read all these, what do you call, books. This master and that master and... And there is no conception of time over there. In the essence, there is nothing like past and future. And they will read some book of something that in my past life I was this and that. Nay, you all are not getting it still. I see your faces all like zombies. <laughs> The moment of birth is the moment of death. Because the energy of birth is the energy of death. Energy of birth is the energy of death. Now I am going to take this same thing a little further, but I will do it later because we won't understand it just now. That one sperm, just keep this in mind, that one sperm reaching. We are going to now take this whole example, maybe tomorrow, on a psychological level. Uh, we are going to try and take it on a psychological level. Now, like we go into school to learn, the essence comes in the school of life. It comes in the school of life for perfection. It wants to learn. Right? <clears throat> it grows a little. And then it stops growing and that's the end. Then only the personality and the false personality grow. (coughs) 
this does not grow. This and this grows. Now for the body to grow, it needs what kind of food? Physical food. Hmm? But for the essence, what food is needed? For the essence to grow. What food is needed? What food is needed? What kind of food is needed for the essence to grow? Attention and awareness. Psychological food. Psychological food. Now, where does it get this psychological food from? It first forms a personality and then it eats that personality and grows. It grows at the cost of personality. And if it does not grow at the cost of personality, the false personality grows. And this is every moment of our lives. So, the essence grows a little and then the false personality comes in and the rest of the life only the personality and the false personality grow. The essence does not grow. Death comes. The essence realizes I am still a young child. I have not grown. I have not got any food. And that's the end of the matter. And most old people, they become young children again. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. It's very rare to see a wise old man. Otherwise, they're all young children. <sighs> a fully developed body does not guarantee a developed essence. So at one point, the growth of the essence stops and the growth of the personality and false personality start and that's the end of everything. Then nothing changes in our life. Now, the body, the personality are in temporal time. Somebody was saying linear time. The essence is not in temporal, it's in a different time. We will call it as vertical times because it has come from a higher dimension to take birth in this time. So, it is a part of a different time. At one point in our lives, the essence becomes so passive that nothing changes in the essence. All that we do brings about change in the personality and it remains incomplete at death. <clears throat> now, I want to just touch on something before I go to personality. I'll talk of myself, so it'll be easier, so I don't have to put it on anyone. I just finished my 59th birthday. So, I'll say I'm going into 60 and I'll say, okay, do I still want to work for life or do I want to work for essence? And working for essence, we will call working for recurrence, working for recurrence. Everything you do in linear time is for life. Temporal time is for life. What can you do for your recurrence? This is a question which I don't know, which came to me some time ago. And I said, I want to change so many things. I don't want to carry them with me. Now, the Vaishnavas have a beautiful word. They call it Ras. 
uh, of course the English translation is enjoyment but it doesn't give the real meaning of the but we'll have to use the word enjoyment we don't have any other word anything which I enjoy goes into my essence right I want enjoy taking revenge on you ne? you don't enjoy it huh it's like eating a when I've taken revenge I've shown you what you are isn't it like eating a big sweet so much of satisfaction but it goes in my essence so I, it, what am I putting for my recurrence can you see what I am investing for my recurrence? You insulted me, right? The inner feeling that I now I have taken my revenge, I have shown you. That feeling, you must have had that feeling. No? But that feeling goes in the essence. I have enjoyed it. You see, enjoyment is not the right word. Rus is the right word, but it's, uh, I can't get the right word. Mane, rus aveshe ni andar. Pleasure is also not the right word, uh, but there's a kind of there's a kind of divine attraction to it. <laughs> it is interest, but there's I get a kind of the saliva comes in my mouth. There is uh, <laughs> when I take revenge. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll say enjoyment. So it goes in my essence. Do I want to carry that in my recurrence? Definitely not. Can you, now you understand the value of what I am trying to tell you. Of course, you all are young, so. Huh? So, you all say we still want to work for life, forget to right? it. Okay. What would we like to carry in our recurrence? So, supposing he has taken a loan from me and he is not returning the money. Right? And the, suddenly the thought comes, Are, he's not given back my money. And I start now thinking the thought. We, it, right? I start thinking the thought. Okay. And in each thinking, I am taking rust or not taking rust. Can you see how it is going in my essence? Do I want it to go in my essence? Do I value that money which is life more than my recurrence? Can you get what I'm trying to say? Now we want to have a total change in our life. We don't want to work for life. We need some things in life. We have to bring two meals to the table every day. We have to pay our bills every month. But now we want to work for our recurrence. Which we take with us. The irritation I have done today is going to recur tomorrow. All that I have taken rus in is going to recur in my next recurrence. It has to recur. I can't leave it over here. Ne? We talk about the Lord of Death, Yum. Uh, yum will say, okay, money, property, everything I will take. But all this you take with you. Uh, that I am not going to take that you take with you, carry it with you. So working for life, that is why I am trying to bring this topic of essence. This is a very different topic which I didn't want to take but because I have been contemplating it for quite some time, I thought I will just share it with you. And because like I am moving on to 60, many of us are moving on to 60 or probably more. Right? So the next 10 years of my life, I want to work for my recurrence. Now, just we'll take few small things, just few small things. Now, what do I want to carry over? What do I want to carry over? Now, supposing I have a habit of keeping everything in a mess. Uh, you come into my room. Uh, maybe day before yesterday's trousers are lying somewhere, the socks are lying somewhere, there's a stack of books lying somewhere, uh, maybe the pillowcases have not been changed for so many days, God knows. Yeah. And I see this mess and I say, I do I want to carry this mess with me? 
or do I want to bring order in my life? Can you understand this? It's a very simple thing. This is, these are very simple things. Do I want to bring order? Now, if I do it with dislike, it is not going to go in the essence. There has to be that enjoyment in doing it. So, I'll say, oh, I, in my next recurrence, I don't want to keep my cup in any way. I want to keep it in a beautiful way. But I do dislike doing it, then it's not going to go in, in my in my essence. It's going to remain in my personality. Am I, I don't know if I'm able to explain to you. You must plan, like people plan for their old age and they'll put some money in some savings account or something that I'll get interest and all. But who plans for the recurrence? So, I'll say, no, I don't want to take this. I want to bring order in my life. So, I'll start consciously putting my things in order and I'll take joy from it. I'll pause over there and I'll put it with joy. And in that joy, that order is going into my essence. I have one cousin and uh, there are many offshoots of the Gurjev groups and he's for last 25 years, he's working with a Gurjev group and very deeply involved in it. So they have a guru in California. And once in a while they go and they, they spend a month over there with their guru. So one day he was telling me that I had the chance of cleaning the guru's bathroom. And he says that when I went in to clean the bathroom, everything was arranged as if it had been arranged twice. Now the second way of taking things is into a sense, one is enjoyment and the other is through consciousness. So I put this here. But I pause, I put it here, now I bring consciousness. I have put it here. Feeling of I. I have put it here. I put it here once, I put it here twice. And it's gone into a sense. Can you understand? So, his guru is very old. He must be over 75. And he says that everything was arranged in such a way that the feeling I got that when I was cleaning his bathroom was that everything had been uh, put there twice. What a beautiful feeling. What a beautiful. Just a simple thing, arrangement of our bathroom. Such a simple thing. Can we consciously now prepare for our recurrence? That is... See, this is, a, I bypassed from the subject which I wanted to take, but this is, could be important to many of us. What do I want to take with me? What do I want to leave over here? And you must sit down and contemplate this. And it cannot be done by any outside influence. Huh? Right? I've been married since 1988. Hmm? And so that's now 26 years of marriage. Yeah, and my wife in 26 years all the time may be telling me that keep your room properly and put your things in order. But by her telling me I do it, it's not going to go into essence. But this suddenly this inner understanding comes. That I don't want to carry this disorderliness. So I'm not interested in earning 10,000 rupees tomorrow. I'm interested in getting my house in order now. Working for recurrence. Right? So, what goes in essence is a permanent change. What goes into personality is a temporal change. Why do I do something? I may be learning music. But if I am learning music out of vanity that I want to play to show others, it can never go into essence. However good a musician I am. 
because there is no pathway for that music to reach the essence. But if I am getting joy out of the very playing of the music, then it goes into essence. So try to go back, look at your lives, see what traits in your life, what characteristics in your life you would like to carry with you. Can you tell me something else? We are going to go into it tomorrow, but I am going to talk about different levels of attention tomorrow. But I am just asking you that when I read a novel, right, James Bond, hmm, and I have to study for an exam. What is the difference in attention? There is still one more, but I am not taking it now. I will take it tomorrow. In the novel, which one is it? Right? And in the for studying for the exam? Try to just see from here I am going to South Africa and at 35 days I am talking on just the centers at one temple only. It is continuous 35 days and every day there is a two hour, two and a half hour talk. Now I want to prepare these notes for my talks. So which attention will that need? Directed attention. Of course, when I start preparing the notes, I'll what will I do? I'll just what will I do? Switch on the TV. I'll switch on the TV, and maybe there's a cricket match going on. So from directed attention, I go to attracted attention. Have you all? You all have. A, I'm sure. Uh, what do you call, gone through this, right? Then I come back through directed attention for some time, maybe I will type in three or four lines and then what will happen? We are going to go in the center, but the instinctive center will come, a cup, chai ho jai, huh? right? So I go and make a tea. Then I come back in the tea, again I may write one line and then again some other new serial has come. How much of directed attention can I hold? Not attracted attention, not what I am interested in. I am interested in the stock market, very easy to attract the attention. Not what I am interested in. Here I have to direct the attention. Right? Because each small thing comes with a different intricacy. Right? Now let's talk about recurrence. Which kind of attention do you want to take in your recurrence? And how much do you have? This is called as dharana shakti in the old whatever shastra. Desh bandha chitasya dharana tat. Pratye ektanta dhyanam patajali, right? Which attention do you want to carry forward? And you can't do it with dislike. Huh? <laughs> if you do it with dislike, it goes into the personality. It does not go in the essence. It does not go in the essence. There has to be that understanding that this is why I am doing it. The why of doing it. I cannot sit on top of you with a foot ruler and make you study for the exam. If I do it, it will go in the personality. It will not go in the essence. What is our capacity to hold attention? Hardly anything. Hardly anything. We will do what we like. We will do what we love. But to do what we dislike. And to work on that from now, if we start now, within a few years, it will be embedded in our essence that when we are born next time, the quality of attention is this. 
And that is the most important thing we can do. Huh. Working for recurrence. Working for recurrence. You see, when I'm daydreaming, huh? Daydreaming that I am very, my word is everything and you are listening to me and you are my servant and whatever. All that is going in my essence because I am extracting joy from it. So the poor essence came into life to learn something but it became worse than what it was. Can you understand what I am trying to say? No. Supposing I have no money. I am daydreaming that maybe I am a millionaire and in my millionaire I am flying in a plane somewhere. And so I am taking joy out of all that daydreaming or am I not taking joy out of that dreaming? So what is it doing? It is going into my recurrence. That is why I am saying understanding is very very important. You get what I am trying to say? This very understanding, without understanding we do anything, it's useless, absolutely. We can't imitate. The whole journey is a journey of inner understanding. Right? Sure. So, yeah. So, age uh, doesn't matter for recurrence to start. It can be understanding. One can start from anyone. You know, I spent the last year, I was very, very close to Tavarya Sand. And I always saw that he never worked for the present moment. He was never limited by this small thing, the present moment. He always worked in a totally different understanding of time. Each action of it was as if it is moving into eternity. The way he would read the newspaper, the way he would make tea, the way he would do everything. It was as if he was extracting that special elixir of life from those small actions and taking it into a recurrence. You, you understand what I am trying to say? In the old days in the ashram, when Bapu was there, Ram Dulare Bapu, I used to, whenever I would stay in the ashram, maybe I stayed a week, 10 days, 15 days, and I always made it a point to take his early morning tea. I would run to the kitchen, get everything together, and take the tea to him, you know. And I would just sit there and watch. And each action, it was not, an, he was, as if he was stretching each moment into eternity, you know, elastic. As if time for him was elastic. You eat a, a chocolate and you stretch the uh, taste of that chocolate from this moment to eternity. As if each moment he was stretching. You, you get what I am trying to say? He was doing just the same things which we do. Nothing different. There was nothing different. But every moment he was working for recurrence. And we work for personality. We work for this time. I invest today, maybe after 10 years I'll get this. You, you get it? what I'm trying to say? So, he was, every moment he was bringing about an eternal change. And this cannot be done in any personality development class or anything. Right? It has to come from inner understanding. Now, I am going to talk of something else in the essence. Now, take one word, we will take, we'll take others later, we will take one word, understanding. Now, how will I relate understanding in temporal time?
then we'll take some who who said jealousy who used the word you used the word jealousy okay there we'll take jealousy later on we first take the word understanding so i'll say i understood something today few days ago i understood something and a few days before that i understood something and when i was a kid in school i was trying to you know do something with mathematics and this thing and suddenly one day i understood something so when i look in my life all these understandings they come in which in a line of time they come in a line of what happens in the essence Yeah, just you are very true, very true. You've already understood, but just try to bring it down to the experiential level. Okay. Supposing I understand one line, what is the inner feeling? Some joy? Yeah, but what is the inner feeling? Joy. what he says there is a feeling of rising up feeling of rising up so that moment of understanding has gone into the essence ha huh? pan i i can fulfillment fulfillment yeah you understand what i'm saying that moment of understanding has gone into essence now how many moments of understanding have i had in my life or no none not cunningness huh? i know what you are going to do tomorrow no not cunningness understanding genuine understanding how many moments of genuine understanding have i had in my life so they will be marked across time like this this point this point this point right but what happens in essence they will all come together because there is no past and future suddenly all those moments of understanding will come together and they will become result of what tawaria sahib calls as resultant intensity what will it mean in my recurrence what will it mean in my recurrence will my capacity to understand increase or decrease increase because now the intensity with which i understand is much try i'll just this thing try to put it in a different way Gurjev has written one book. It's called Bilzebub's Tales to His Grandson. Right? And he took thirty years to write the book. And he would write one chapter, and he would keep it in a group of his disciples and ask them to read it. And he would be looking from far away, and he would be observing everyone's faces. And if he saw that one person understood something he would rewrite the whole chapter anyway he started in 1920 and when he died in 1949 the book was ready and i spent 6 years with under tawaria sahib's guidance and many times he told me that he has put everything in this book and when i read his what he has left i can see that that book is there in everything he he's written you know there's somewhere or the other something is you know been influenced by that book now a group of us supposing we are reading the book now there is one paragraph and if i read it 10 times i may understand something but somebody else will read it 3 times and he'll understand what takes me 
10 times of reading. Can you see the intensity of understanding is more and here the intensity of understanding is less. So all that understanding which I have done in my life, what I have understood has nothing to do with essence. That is a part of temporal time. You get what I am trying to say? It's not what have I, but have I gone through that experience of understanding? And that will come together and there will be an intensity. And this happens at the moment of death because the personality dies and the essence does not die. And all this is becoming essence at that time. You, you get what I am trying to say? Now let's take jealousy. Right? I saw his motorcycle and I got jealous. Oh, or I saw somebody's TV and I got jealous. Right? And this I got jealous or, right? I saw my girlfriend talking with somebody else and I got jealous, etc. And all these jealousies, they are strung across temporal time. Can, can you see it? But at the moment of death, all of them are going to be, come together and become one intensity. I don't want to carry that. I don't want to carry that. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? That is working for my recurrence. Say irritation. In small, small things I get irritated. Tea is cold, I get irritated. This is not put properly, I get irritated. My wife says something, I get irritated. Shoes not in order, I get irritated. Huh? No cereal on TV, I get irritated. Now, all these irritations are in temporal time. But the moment they go into my recurrence, they are all coming as an intensity of, I want to be free of this. Yeah. But I have not enjoyed it, right? For your sense. What? How does it get into my sense? For something to get into your sense. Right. You need to enjoy it. Right, but there is a negative enjoyment. There is rust. There is a, what do you call, there is a hypnotic, there is a hypnotic, uh, what do you call attraction in that jealousy? That is why I said that word rust I have translated as enjoyment, but it's not the right. You get what I'm trying to say? It's a kind of rust which I take from it. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to translate this word. I think you've understood. It's a very deep rooted satisfaction that you get from that. Yeah. Very intense and it happens with all our negative emotions all our negative emotions there is an intense hypnotic attraction to negativity because it is at that time that i feel i right <clears throat> same thing so try to look at the line of time in your life Try to look at the line of time of essence which moves vertical to each moment of life. It is not this line of time. Every moment of our life is cut by essence. And essence is there all the time. And the minute we put something into the essence, it just accumulates in intensity. I use this word essence, work, work, work. And I have been listening to work, and now when I actually ponder upon it, what exactly is essence? It's planetary material, starry material. It's a good question. Good question. <laughs> Supposing I am angry, that anger, what is the materiality of that anger? Materiality of that anger. I am really growing old. What material is that anger made of? Is it made of material from Mars, the planetary magnetism of Mars. 
supposing i have eaten a good meal i go to a restaurant i eat a good meal and i am feeling joyful and satisfied what planetary material is allowing me to feel joyful and satisfied jupiter right jupiter but i have this urge to create this wonderful piece of art so what is giving me that inner urge to create where is it coming from venus can you see but this morning i am in a bad state you know i am doing this and then i am doing this and then i am doing this and then i am doing that and i can't sit for a single second which planet is expressing itself through me mercury so all my experiences in my life they are there because of planetary material you get it so the essence is planetary material and the experience i want it to take is of the real i for that i have to change the essence i have to transform the essence from lower matter i have to change it to higher magnetism that is the essence the real i is beyond the essence i am not talking about it now not talking because that i want to bring in something else when i talk about real i i want to bring back that example of all those sperms dying yeah so i i'm not talking about, so essence is that which behind the essence is the soul the real i the soul is made of planetary matter it is the i the real i the the atma is encased in planetary matter because all experiences lie in planetary matter and consciously it transforms the planetary matter so that instead of taking experience of the outside it can take experience of self and this effort is sadhana now am i little clear on what is essence okay difficult huh?